Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison, and I want to welcome you to day 265 of Humanity Rising. Today, we want to contemplate peace. It seems rather scarce in our world today. A year into our pandemic, there's been a rise in domestic violence and the exacerbation of our mental and public health in virtually every country in the world. There are ethnic rivalries uh, sprouting up in various countries. Uh, there's an assault on democracy, uh, most specifically uh, in the United States, uh, as our constitution and our democratic processes are under direct threat by one of our major parties. Uh, President Biden and the G7 are meeting as we speak, as they do uh, each year to try to fashion a world order that can ensure stability. Uh, but our world is increasingly unstable uh, because uh, most fundamentally, we've destroyed our ecosystem. And in the last 50 years have wiped out nearly 70% of the entire biodiversity of our planet. So the fragility of our world is very apparent to us. And that deepens our yearning for harmony with each other and harmony with the earth. And that's the meaning of peace is harmony. It's not just the absence of conflict. It's a proactive way of being in the world. So from the very beginning of humanity rising, we've emphasized as one of our meta themes, not only the regeneration of humanity and the ecology, but the perennial wisdom of what peace means in our time. And that gave rise to our Peace Lab, uh, which is uh, convening this program today. Uh, but before we launch into our program, let us take a moment, as we always do, just to pause and enter your body. Place your attention in your body and take a few deep breaths. Close your eyes and place your attention on your heart. And for the next minute or so, just attune yourself as you can to your heartbeat in a spirit of gratitude and deep thanksgiving. That you're alive. We're all alive at this most extraordinary moment in the human journey. Thank you, everyone. Now with an open heart and a heart full of gratitude and love for each and every one of you who are joining our session today, 
I want to welcome our Peace Lab. This has been one of the most important initiatives to come out of Humanity Rising, uh, initially with the Kurt Kruger and then Leslie Southwick Trask, uh, who have formulated uh, our, our peace theme uh, for Humanity Rising. And uh, now on a monthly basis are bringing together peacemakers around the theme of how we shape peace in our time. You know both of them. Uh, Kurt and Leslie have been frequent uh, presences uh, in Humanity Rising and in our chat group. And so Leslie, Kurt, I turn the program over to you with much love and deep appreciation for everything that you've done to support and to help develop Humanity Rising. Well, thank you so much, Jim, for being here and being the cause of all of this. We wouldn't uh, have such a an education for us all. And you've allowed us to be able to, to welcome everybody right now today, like you do, with great respect and love. And we're going to have our intention today is to, of the, the Peace Lab's intention is to explore the shaping of our current reality in terms of peace in 2021. This will open us to the change in assumptions and beliefs that will bring into existence global peace at the individual and collective levels. Now today, our session's intention is to have a visceral experience of the shapes that reflect human evolution, their origin, meaning, and impact. And to be inspired to see and feel the shape of peace in 2021. One more, to imagine our own unique shape as living system, a living open system. And Leslie will take it away to bring you a fascinating program. It is a practical program, so experience it today. Oh my goodness. My cohort in peace, you just bring it, like you just radiate it. And so it is such joy to be with you. I would like to dedicate this program today to two elements of where peace is most needed. And because I'm broadcasting from Canada, my first dedication is to our First Nations and all of the ramifications that are happening in the lack of truth and reconciliation in this country when it comes to the finding of the 250, 15 bodies in Kamloops under a residential school. We have so much peace making to do when it comes to our First Nations and the tragedies that still are uncovered and held in secret in terms of under the ground and in the vaults of the Catholic Church in terms of what is happening and happened to our First Nations. And my other dedication is to the Muslim family who was knocked down by a truck in London, Ontario this weekend in a hate crime against Muslims. You know, in Canada, we think of ourselves as so incredibly peaceful and, and open and respecting of all life form. And so when these tragedies occur, we have to stop and sit and reflect on what and how is our constellation of energy affecting these types of incidences to be buried and to still occur. So I dedicate my, um, this program to our First Nations and to the Salmon family in London, Ontario. I'm gonna take a breath on that because it's important to recognize that moment. You know, Kurt, one of the things that is really <laughs> incredible is that I wish we could actually just show our, our Peace Lab program preparation, all the weeks of constant conversation we have with these wonderful people that are coming in to our community. And I wanna do a shout out to Dr. Tati Blackstone, who is the superwoman of our Peace Lab in this moment in time, and who has been so seminal in the creation of what we're doing in this moment and how we bring in these two amazing women. I'm going to introduce both women uh, that are going to be leading the first part of this program 
uh, because it is kind of hard to introduce these forces, these forces of nature. So I'm going to first start with Lois. And some of you may in fact recognize Lois, Lois Farfel Stark. Um, she would, you have maybe seen her on NBC News. Uh, she covered tensions and transitions in Liberia, Ab Ab Abu Dhabi, Israel, South Africa, Northern Ireland, Cuba, and throughout the US. She has been at the front line of covering these tensions that are, we are witness to in this current moment of our history. But I think that where I really start to see Lois's beauty of, of life and her eye on the camera is through her documentaries. And most significantly in the book that I was so excited to get, which is the telling image, Shapes of Changing Times. And I literally sat with this book, reading and drinking in the imagery that uh, Lois has gathered from all over the world as she's traveled to understand the shapes that shape us, whether it be in architecture, medical research, art, the nature of social issue, everything you can imagine she has been exploring in terms of shape. And joining us also is Claudia Wells, who is no stranger to this platform uh, with her origin and work in heart math. But today we're really looking into the notion of what IONS brings to us. And if you are not familiar with IONS, it's the Institute of Noetic Sciences that was founded by Apollo 14 astronaut and the sixth man to walk on the moon, Captain Ed Mitchell. You know, it's interesting, what do you say? What do these things have to do with peace? Well, it, I find it fascinating that years ago, Willis Harmon, who was the president of IONS at the time, asked uh, Claudia to join in a five-year peace building through business inquiry at the Fetzer Institute. And she has gone on, Claudia has gone on to do amazing work in pioneering social responsibility and sustainable uh, curriculums for global organizations. These women have many, many other attributes in their resume, and I'm going to definitely encourage you to not only look them up on the program description today, but also to go into their work, which is absolutely breathtaking. So it is with great joy that we're going to start our journeying today with the inevitable, the inconquerable, Lois Farfel Stark. That's oh, very generous of you, Leslie, and a warm, warm hello to everybody joining out there today. And high salutes to both Leslie and Jim, Kurt and Daniel and Toddy. What you have brought us all is an explosion of open minds, identified emerging ideas, connected the dots of all that is coming up and bubbling up in our particular moment of time. And special gratitude to Claudia Wells for being on the today's program. She will amaze you as she always does with her grace and her vision. So now I'll begin with a series of images, which um, I'll share my thoughts on how I see how shape has shaped us from indigenous man through modern technology. So off we go if the computer gods are with us. <laughs> Let's uh, give it a try here. So. Looks good, Lois, your full screen. Thank you, but it's not, okay. Now we're off. <laughs> so how do we humans make sense of the world in something as simple as shape? We can find a key to the mental map of our era, the very shapes of our shelters, social systems, and sacred sites reveals how we organize and orient, what we value, what we believe. But when the shapes shift, it alerts us that a new world order has entered. As a documentary filmmaker, I was trained to make sense by looking for a telling image, some picture that conveyed the essence of a story. 
I'd land in a foreign country and have to find a visual that represented the mindset of that culture. And I found a clue hiding in plain sight. It was shape itself. Once I looked for shape, I saw it everywhere in buildings, behaviors, and beliefs. Shape first popped out for me when I filmed a tribal ritual in Liberia. It was a girl's initiation ceremony from childhood to adulthood. And I noticed that here, women danced in a circle. And that circle dance was in the center of their circular settlement. Round thatched huts surrounded them, repeating the image. And the ceremonies themselves were about human life cycles. So everything in the scene, grass huts, circle dances, initiation ceremonies, all had aspects of a circular woven web. Yet the very next day I filmed in Monrovia, Liberia's capital, and here soldiers lined up shoulder to shoulder, row upon row, in perfect pods, looking like graph paper being turned. And they marched in front of generals, also in a straight row, adorned with medals, announcing their place in the hierarchy. Everything here looked like a ladder, straight lines, ranks of authority. And it made me wonder why humans went from seeing the world as a web to understanding it as a ladder. And I realized that a change in shape signaled a change in a way of living and a way of thinking. It was another way to read history, not as a series of kings and wars, but as a change in shape. So we're off to these four shapes. It'll be a fast forward ride through time, seeing how we've shaped our mental maps from the past of an interconnected web and a linear ladder to our present moment where the web and ladder merge in a helix, today's biological revolution and a network the icon of today's technological revolution. And at the end, I'll suggest a new pattern that seems to be emerging. But we begin with the web, the time of indigenous cultures. A web is about circles, interconnections, parts woven into a whole. There are multiple paths in a, lot, in a web, it's not the single path that comes in a ladder. So it's more about equality. All parts on the perimeter are equally distant from the center. And like a spider's web, a vibration anywhere is felt everywhere. Shelters all around the globe imitated the web. There are round thatched huts in Central Africa, domes of bent timber in Kenya. In Australia and Africa, spheres of straw and mud. In the Arctic, Arctic sorry, there are domes of ice. And in the Ukraine, it was mammoth bones that formed the domes some 15,000 years ago. Sacred sites also repeat the web. Stonehenge is the most famous stone circle, but there were thousands of stone circles in the British Isles alone, and they appear on every single continent. Australian Aborigines trace concentric circles in the sand to express their view of the universe. Labyrinths are used all over the globe in every continent. There is a version of it for sacred inner journeys. And American Indians built medicine wheels to point to their North Star and to be used for healing. These cultures never had contact with each other, but they all use the web shape to express their understanding that humans were not separate from nature, they were embedded in nature. 
and spirit was in all things. Even the language in these early cultures revealed their understanding of the world as a connected web. In the Dagora tribe in Africa, there was no word for you. A word as basic and simple as the difference between you and me did not exist. But the closest translation of their word for you meant my other self. Imagine living in a culture where the other is you. The Yanomamis lived huddled in the Amazon rainforest, closely woven to each other and to nature. They understood their role as honoring nature, not changing nature. And this way of life existed for 90% of human existence. So how could a world based on the eternal constants of nature possibly change? But it did. Farming entered, that was the big change maker. And that was approximately 10,000 years ago. Men learned to plant and plow fields, to control nature enough to have barley sprout near their homes with no need to migrate. The first time people could survive through four seasons in one place and farming was so successful that populations multiplied. A new order was needed to keep track of these growing populations, to count the grain and food storage, ever larger populations. So the shape shifted and the latter model took the new reality of these expanded populations. A ladder is about hierarchy and measurement. Each rung is higher or lower than another. Power's at the top. It's a world of right, wrong, yes, no, win, lose. So the worldview went from meaning to metrics, from qualities to quantities, from web to ladder. Pyramids popped up on every continent as populations grew ever larger where they were. We're familiar with the pyramids in Egypt and they literally point to the sun god in the sky. But this shape says something new and big and different. The divine is now in the heavens, no longer in the earth. Pyramids appeared in Central America and some had these rounded sides, but they still pointed up. This pyramid is Uxmal and it was built 3,000 years after the Egyptian ones. It's the same shape without contact between cultures. In Southeast Asia, there were multiple pyramids on temple grounds. And in India, the pyramids were built at a steeper angle, had different decorations, dedicated to different gods, but they still pointed up. So shape itself is telling us the political, social, and theological order. And in this cathedral in Milan, the pyramid is still evident, making the point even stronger with steeples and spires. So think about what these shapes are telling us. God is kicked upstairs into the heavens, out of reach. And you need a priest or a king to tell you what God is saying. Today's skyscrapers announce their place and power in the sky as pyramids did in earlier times. This is Dubai skyline where the buildings are so high, they look down at the clouds. It's an eerie image. It changes our notion of basically what is up and what is down. And this is a chart of buildings that go through the ladder mentality. So it starts with Egyptian pyramids and it ends with the two uh, towers in Kuala Lumpur.
But on the very far right, there is a building that's low and close to the ground. And that's Microsoft's headquarters. Its shape itself signals that something has changed, something new has entered. And it's not a coincidence that the Microsoft building is about computers. The computer is the change agent to the next, just as farming was the change agent from web to ladder times. The computer chip has ladder lines but it catapults us to connectivity. A helix actually combines aspects of a web and a ladder. It both revolves and evolves simultaneously. And as the double helix of DNA, it both twists like a web and has the crossbars of a ladder. DNA's helix is nature's way to tell the story of past, present, and future. You know your children will carry some of your genes, but you don't know what they will look like. DNA takes the past, mixes genes in fresh combinations, and passes them generation to generation. It answers the riddle of how things can recur without repeating. So in this shape, both pattern and the unpredictable are both at play. The helix shape is in architecture as well. And it's not a coincidence at the same time in the 50s that both the DNA shape and the design for this helical building in New York uh, were both being thought of simultaneously in the same decade. The, it's a helix on the inside and the outside. And from the inner rail, it looks like an apple being peeled in one stroke. It, upends our expectation and breaks the mold of the rectangular thinking we've been so familiar with living in. There's no flat floors, no flat walls, no square galleries. It changes the very way we orient. In Singapore, this grass roofed building twists like a helix. But inside is a multi-story glass building. Yet the building disappears to the eye as if it's camouflaged on the campus by this green roof. In China, each floor of this helical apartment building twists so that every apartment can catch its own direct angle to the sun. Now picture the double helix with all of its crossbars and picture it bursting open. You have a network, the shape of today's technological revolution. Networks are wild with reverberation, interconnection, possibilities. Powers in the hubs, but they're multiple hubs not the concentrated power at the top of the ladder. The more hubs there are, the more power it has. But if you lose some hubs, the system keeps on going. So it's not like a toppled ladder. Networks may seem like a web, but the earlier web had flatness and one center and the networks link endlessly in all dimensions at once, constantly reverberating. And we all know they master our daily lives, how we rely on the internet to shop, to bank, to socialize, to learn. It's even changed the way we think. Network thinking has replaced linear logic. The current generation thinks by hyperlinks, no longer in progressive order. And the network thinking 
will affect the minds of children in ways that we cannot imagine. This is the exterior and interior of a new building in New York called The Vessel. It's in the Hudson Yard neighborhood and it's a gathering place to interact like the old town square. But this gathering place is a network of pathways filled with choices to go up or down or right or left. And these beautiful shapes are all bacteria colonizing, but they colonize in a wild variety of network formations. In response to stress, bacteria create partnerships. So there's a lesson here. Bacteria have been alive three and a half billion years. So they have something to teach us about this shape and the value of cooperative systems. In the web era, humans were natured center. In the latter era, we were human centered. And now we're becoming planet centered. We needed the latter power of measurements to create the technology that launches us to space. The rocket ship even looks like a ladder pointing to the sky, just like the pyramids did. But as the astronaut Edgar Mitchell said, we went to the moon as technicians. We were turned from the moon as humanitarians. So what's next? What new shape can hold differences, diversity, dynamic change, the way that nature does? And I suggest that one possibility is a torus, the shape of a donut. So picture a spinning donut. It's the shape of a feedback loop, self-regulating, in continuous motion. There can be wild interaction among everything inside, but it flows in an overall pattern. So it holds both pattern and the unpredictable. Some physicists think that the universe itself is a torus. So imagine seeing the world as if you were coming out of the top, out of the center and over the cylinder. You'd see an expanding universe. But now imagine yourself folding back under into the center. You'd see a contracting universe. The shape of the system holds opposites, expansion and contraction. And when you enlarge your lens, what had looked like opposites shift to one elegant whole. This donut shape is popping up in architecture as well. This is a hotel in China built as an upright ring. It's both above the water and below the water. Its interior rooms have exterior views. If you wander inside, your view continually changes. So living in new shapes reshapes our thinking. A plastic exchange factory in China is also built as an upright ring, this time on land. And this is the new British intelligence gathering building outside of London, kind of like our CIA building. But gone are straight lines, flat walls, even a sense of turning right or left disappear. The shape encourages communication between departments and encourages looking at situations through multiple perspectives. But humans, did not invent this donut shape. Nature beat us to it. The magnetic field around our bodies is this shape. And the magnetic field around Earth is this shape. Nature does not change. 
the map in our mind changes and how we describe the world inscribes our thinking. This is a thermal image of Earth from space. You see messy, chaotic systems, oceans swirl in currents and countercurrents, clouds twirl in one direction and then another. But you see that overall, nature systems are in balance. The view from above shows us that what had looked like opposing forces become complementary forces in a larger and larger whole. So imagine being an astronaut orbiting Earth. Your view continually changes. There's an infinity of perspectives, of changing landscapes. But viewed from above, differences turn into patterns. From this perspective above Earth, what had seemed chaotic snaps to the beauty of the big picture. Today, web thinking returns, but in entirely new terms, green thatched huts become grass roofed buildings and we relearn we are a part of nature. The interdependency of early cultures becomes the connectivity of the internet. And we relearn what the Dagara tribe knew. You are my other self. We relearn our connectivity in global repercussions, viral epidemics, financial linkages, cyber attacks. Like the early web, a vibration anywhere is felt everywhere. To think out of the box, you need to know the box you're in. You realize now that we have shifted from seeing the world as a repeating cycle to understanding it as linear progress to seeing the oneness of Earth from space. And now you can add shape as a key to read the past and glimpse the future. We shape our world, but then it shapes us. Thank you very much. Lois, whenever I see these images, I'm just taken in to our sense of history and who we are and who we're becoming. And I just want us to take a, a moment because you've shared with us such powerful imagery. If we could just take a moment to breathe in and just come to recognize the shapes that are influencing us in this moment, each of us individually. What shapes are forming themselves around us that catch our eye, that inform our way of thinking? And so with that reflection, I wish to welcome in Claudia Wells, who is going to help take us further on this exploration as the shape from space. Thanks, Claudia. Thank you, Leslie, and thank you, Lois. Uh, that was amazing, Lois. I thought I knew what you were gonna say, but you said so much more in such a short amount of time. It's great to be back with everyone on Humanity Rising. I was actually surprised to realize that I was first on Humanity Rising a year ago. It was day 21 and day 30 in June, 2020. Day 21 was on interconnecting the elements of global transformation. And day 30 was on the science of heart coherence and projects to scale coherence from personal to social and planetary systems. So this program today, day 265, I think, feels to me a little like if day 21 and 30 had a baby. <laughs> it's not the math, the math doesn't work, but the topics do. And I'm so grateful to have been invited to co-create with the Peace Lab and with Lois Stark. 
by going a little deeper into the expanded view from space and what it has to do with the shapes that shape us, especially in the context of global transformation and heart coherence. For me, one of the most influential examples of being shaped by this view from space in our modern world is from Apollo 14 astronaut and sixth man to walk on the moon, Captain Ed Mitchell, who had a life altering epiphany seeing earth with his own eyes for the first time through the lens of space, an experience that came to be known as the overview effect in which through a sudden and brief realization, Ed saw everything in their separateness, but experienced them in their unity. And we thought that rather than saying more about that now, we'd provide a short experience using media created at the Institute of Noetic Sciences or IONS, which is the science organization that Ed, Mitch, Ed Mitchell founded when he returned from the moon. So while we transition over to that, um, I suggest we close our eyes and do another quick coherence practice by shifting our attention again to our hearts. And imagine breathing in and out through the heart, just to anchor our attention there. Science shows that even the simple act of placing our attention on a part of the body begins to enliven and change that part. That's how powerful our attention is. Now imagine you're on the surface of the moon, approximately 240,000 miles from earth, and you're about to lift off for your return home. Feel the immense gratitude that you'd feel for a successful mission and liftoff. And for all the people that have to do their parts perfectly to bring you home safely. Lunar module pilot, Captain Ed Mitchell is your co-pilot. Ed's no longer on planet with us, but that's his actual voice from the archives that you'll be hearing. And just keep breathing in and out through your heart and open your eyes when you hear the audio begin. standing by. I had completed my major task for going to the moon and was on the way home.
saw the Earth, the Sun, the Moon, and a 360-degree panorama of the heavens. The magnificence of all of this. All matter in our universe is created in star systems. The matter in my body and the matter in the spacecraft and the matter in my partner's bodies was the product of stars. We are stardust, and we're all one in that sense. I could reach out and touch the furthest parts and experience the vast reaches of the universe. How magnificent this universe that we inhabit. And around we go. I was aware of being an integral part of the entire universe for one brief instant. As I continued to gaze at Earth, the euphoria, the sense of oneness, of wholeness, of participation, changed into a feeling of deep despair, the darkest, blackest despair. that blue atmosphere and white clouds were my people, the crew of Spaceship Earth, in disharmony and disarray, a species not knowing our own potential, nor the limitlessness of our creative capability. spirit within us is the guiding force that makes mankind great. For Earth to survive as a planet, we, humankind, must rise to the challenge of learning to be stewards to Earth and to each other. can follow the patterns of the generations before who believed because we were few in number and the earth was so large that its resources would last forever. Who believed, and we still believe, that conquest creates conformity.
and threat produces peace. We function like 12 cylinder engines, operating on only one cylinder because we do not know what we are. change our belief, we will see ourselves differently. We often say, seeing is believing, when precisely the opposite is true. Believing is seeing. To become the creative, intelligent, loving creatures of the universe, that is our true reality. I cry every time I see that. Absolutely breathtaking and life affirming. But Claudia, having worked with IONS and the work that you have done with Edgar's initiation, what do you think happened to him in space? What, what was that seminal shift in belief that he experienced? Hmm. Thanks, Leslie. Well, I had the great privilege of being able to talk with him about it. But there's a quote that I love from another astronaut who said that of all the arguments pro and con for going to the moon, no one ever suggested we should do it to look back at Earth. But that may be the most important reason to go. And that was certainly the case for Ed. It changed everything for him while well, it changed him. And uh, what do I think happened to him? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know me, <laughs> I'm, I'm convinced that his epiphany was delivered through an experience of heart coherence. Heart coherence is itself an energetic shape that shapes us, signifying optimal functioning in the human system. I know Humanity Rising um, regulars know about heart coherence. But you know how uh, when, when we sign our names, our signatures have a shape. And some people claim they can tell us about our personalities from that shape. Well, HeartMath considers coherence to be the energetic signature of love at the core of the human system, particularly unconditional love. And this energetic signature creates, makes um, us a whole that's greater than the sum of our parts because heart coherence causes our hearts, our brains and our nervous systems to synchronize, expanding our perceptual abilities. And Ed had this expanded sense perception. He didn't just experience an expanded outer lens from being in space as big a perspective shift as that is. He also experienced an expanded inner lens, meaning he perceived from a more integrated intelligence inside himself. And that's why I think he had an epiphany where, you know, other astronauts will come home with a more holistic perspective of Earth. And another reason I think coherence was involved is because Ed's epiphany was brought on by feelings of awe and ecstasy, love and reverence that, that are evoked from seeing this beautiful glowing circle in space. And those are among the regenerative emotions that we know invite the heart into greater coherence. But we didn't know about that then. The field of neurocardiology didn't emerge for another 10 years. And when Ed couldn't find an explanation for his epiphany in the scientific literature, he turned to the spiritual literature. And it was the Sanskrit term, samadhi, which is a heightened state of consciousness and a perception of oneness 
that he used to describe his experience. And from then on, he dedicated his life to the science of what was considered spiritual phenomena. You could say the science of peace to help evolve humanity by healing the split between science and spirit. You know, Ed didn't believe in, in anything supernatural. He, he believed that science just didn't understand what natural really meant. And then most profoundly, Leslie, um, I think his epiphany, well, I know that his epiphany also revealed to him that unconditional love is the organizing principle of the entire cosmos. And obviously we don't need to go to space to have that recognition. We don't need to see this circle from the lens of space, thank goodness. Uh, that, that realization is always available through the interview, no matter where we are, but however we get there, Ed believed in, and I think we all believe it's urgent that we do. Mm. Indeed. And so I want to welcome in Lois to join us in this dialogue because it's continuing our exploration into this notion of the shapes and how shapes inform us and the shape of the consciousness and the shape of the magnetic field. I mean, all of these things that are woven in through us uh, and around us and about us. So I want to raise the question, what is the shape of peace as you see it? Lois, what do you think is the shape of peace? I think there are multiple shapes, so I'll give you maybe four uh, different versions that I've come up with, but I know for each person it will be its own variation, uh, and again, variation within pattern. But um, one first idea in this paths and point of views toward peace would be a story that I call the chopstick story. And I was in China and a military general asked me my view of the American Chinese relationship. And my answer was chopsticks. It takes two forces in careful balance to feed yourself and feed your country. So when you have those opposing forces for a common purpose, then it can be a treaty, it can be detente, it can be something that prevents a hot war. That's one version of peace. Another is that peace is not static. It's always in motion. And the labyrinth, those inner journeys which have appeared on every continent for millenniums, it's also in motion. Each quadrant you trace your steps in one direction, and then you do switchbacks in the other direction. So it's almost a modeling of that picture that we saw earlier of cloud systems and weather systems and ocean systems. They're, they look turbulent, but overall, they balance each other in nature. And it's also like a bicycle like the kind of flow state that people often speak of in sports and in creativity, when you come into that moment when everything coalesces. And that moment is like pedaling toward peace on the bicycle because you have momentum, but you have to participate with it, which is one of the words that came out in Edgar Mitchell's commentary that participation, that it's not a permanent resting place. A third idea of peace is from a Hopi sand painting. And they made the picture of the world as a circle with an opening at the top, it did not close. And that top was not in the north as we usually draw the circle and the four directions. The top of the Hopi opening was east. And that's where the light gets in. That's where the sun rises. That's where each day is birthed anew. And the Hopis 
thought they were responsible for the sun coming up, that they had to honor it and do their uh, sun dance and be with it to make that participation with nature. So you can imagine the opening as where the light gets in, where spirit enters the world, where evolution and change and mystery also come in because it's not a fixed closed circle. And the last thought I had about it was that peace can come with a view from above, that larger lens. And spherical thinking is one of the payoffs of the moon uh, trip. One of the astronauts commented that it isn't just that you can see all sides as we might think democracy is seeing all sides. It's actually in a sphere, there are no sides. It's the wholeness that's so important. And peace as a source from humility is another way to imagine. So if you're looking back, as Claudia said, uh, at earth, you see that wholeness. If you're looking back, not just from the moon, but as Voyager one went past all of our planets, out past the solar system, Carl Sagan suggested that the camera be turned around. It's the same principle and look back at Earth. And there, it's not a beautiful blue marble. It's the tiniest little gray dot. And when we can see that and see our place in ever larger holes and understand we're still a part of it, it's still a pattern and the unpredictable. It's still our place in ever larger systems. Then we can enlarge our lens experience wonder and awe and know the beauty will always be there of ever and ever and ever larger systems <laughs> you know as you as you described each of those shapes i was taken into a different pattern of thinking you know a, a different way of seeing what the unexperiencing what the tensions were how they were being balanced what the viewfinder how wide the lens was. That's how powerful each of those images inform our sense of belief, but then our belief about what that means. So Claudia, when you start to think about the, the notion of these images and the work that you're doing with the global um, coherence pulse, I mean, how all these things come together, what, what's your response? Needed. I have a general response, and then if I may, I have a specific response for each of those shapes that Lois shared. Um, and Lois, I heard you say before, I don't think you said it today, so I want to say it because it's a, it's a beautiful way to frame things, that the trajectory of the shapes you see as nature, man, singularity returns back to that unity principle. Did I get that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I think that's, that is such a helpful framing. And I also like to frame it as nature, man, man as nature, or even nature as man. It's this, this spiraling up or spiraling return to the realization, as you said earlier, that not only are we not separate from nature, but we're a conscious co-creative part of it. Uh, I really wanted to share the James Gardner quote that I first heard from Jim Garrison during a Shards Mystery School retreat many years ago, that humanity is the medium through which nature has engineered her own comprehension. Mm -hmm. And for me, seeing earth from space is part of that engineered comprehension. It's one of the main reasons we're going. And again, the science of heart coherence is so helpful here because it reveals that coherence is the body's resonant frequency, and it's the same as one of Earth's primary resonant frequencies. And I wanted to share that because when, when we embody coherence, mm. 
you can think when we embody love and we embody peace, we create shapes that are resonant with nature's intelligence and resonant with the belief that we're all in this together. And we saw some of those shapes. When we embody incoherence, we create shapes that reflect beliefs in separation and exploitation of nature and of each other and the ethos of every man for himself. And I say this without judgment because we're a young species and we're still figuring it out. But because post materialist science suggests that consciousness is primary. And if we can think of consciousness as a shape, consciousness is primary, not matter. It's important to shape the consciousness giving shape to our material world. And um, looking at those, those um, shapes that you just raised, those shapes of peace, Lois. First, um, the chopsticks, the two forces holding tension and creative balance, coherence also balances tensions. Think of the tension we feel when our hearts tell us to do one thing and our heads tell us to do another. <laughs> Coherence balances heart and brain intelligences, creating a more holistic intelligence that results from them working together. And that allows us to hold tensions in our lives with more equanimity, more resilience, more creativity. Um, you also mentioned earth as a circle and I've heard you say that before, and it makes me wonder that if when Earth is viewed from space, might it communicate the, the timeless message that, that you remind us that the circle has meant throughout the history of humanity? Might that all be communicated on an unconscious level? And could that have been part of what um, gave Ed his epiphany? The labyrinth in flowing motion Coherence is a dynamic stability, like a vital piece, allowing life force to flow through a system, healing fragmentation and creating an undivided wholeness in flowing motion, which I actually think um, is a David Bohm's definition of a Taurus. And I mean, that, that's, that's true for us, as long as we don't pinch off that flow. The classic... Um, the art of peace says that past, present, and future are all contained in the life force. And I think that's how Ed felt so connected to the entire cosmos. I think that's how he downloaded the whole story. And then um, the circle that doesn't close at the top, that's my favorite. I don't really consider earth to be a closed system. I mean, yes, our physical resources are limited and need to be respected and used regeneratively, even when we start mining the moon and asteroids for resources, which we're planning to do. But more to the point, Earth's never been a closed system energetically. Life takes instruction from the sun. Humans are impacted by space weather. Our hearts are sensory organs and sensitive detectors responsive not only to geophysical influences, but also to astrophysical ones. You brought up Lois, uh, Earth's electromagnetic fields. Well, those are influenced by solar weather and the heart is the most responsive part of the body to those changes. And I, I don't wanna get too trippy here, but it occurs me to ask, looking at Earth as an open energetic system, where does unconditional love come from? So I see coherence reflected in all of those shapes of peace that you shared. And just to state the obvious, the reason I, I'm talking about coherence and I'm connecting it to this topic is because I consider the energetic signature of heart coherence itself to be a powerful shape of peace. I saw someone in the chat say, what are the shapes within us that shape our world? I think that's the main one. And we know how to start sharing that um, right now. Well, you know, one of the statements that Ed makes in that, in that piece is that we are all stardust. And that is the belief that I, that I most resonate with. Uh, because when I go into the, into the essence of how that informs me, I experience unconditional love because the stardust in us seems for me in any event. And this is, again, the connection between 
what I believe and what I see and then how I give meaning. I mean, that entire um, contextual circle that we create in our mind's eye. But when I go into the notion of I am stardust, I'm literally part of this open system. And I feel I, I, it brings me into the coherence of the heart and that magnetic field. And I think we each have our own way of how we connect it. But that for me, when he, when I, when I heard him say that a long time ago, I went, ha, ah, now, now I'm, now I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and if I can just circle back to what Lois said um, regarding when Ed said that they went up technologists and came home humanitarians or I think sometimes he said humanist. Uh, the overview replaced his ordinary awareness of earth as being comprised of separate nations and races in a meaningless universe with the holistic view of one people at one with the planet, with one destiny and at one with the universe. And it also moved him, as you say, from a reductionist view of himself to experiencing himself, not just in the universe, but the universe in him. So yes, he was star stuff. And, and he fundamentally believed that his experience um, of unity, this, this direct experience of unity foreshadowed a new wave of evolution in human consciousness. Uh, and that just directed the rest of his life, that conviction. And you're continuing his work. And I just want you to have a moment to share with us the global coherence pulse, because I think it's, it's a really powerful way for us to, to be in this connection. Well, just real quickly, I think that that was day 30 <laughs> on Humanity Rising. We, we spoke with Roland McCready and you know I'm part of the Global Coherence Initiative and the Global Coherence Initiative has been working on the science and the technology of how to um, scale heart coherence from personal to social and planetary systems and um, building a network of sensors so that we can actually see the shape of peace, the shape of our collective peace in the electromagnetic fields of the planet and also in other ways, in a, a growing number of ways. And while that's been happening, now the Pulse has come up to help build the, the social network to help build the critical mass of humanity uh, creating coherence in our hearts that the sensors can actually pick up. So it's like we're creating these personal shapes, these personal inner shapes that our outer technologies can pick up and reflect back to us. Because unfortunately we still live in a world that um, and Ed said it, we think seeing is believing when actually believing is seeing. But right now we need to um, see to believe. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're building a critical mass of people to shift the whole system. Amazing. Lois, anything that you'd like to add uh, before we start to explore the shape within us? Uh, just one more qualitative thought on that thin membrane that sustains us is that it's porous. Mm -hmm. And as you were speaking of the sun's uh, electromagnetism coming to us and our responsibility toward that porous nature to keep it in its protective source, keep it in its communication source. I think uh, without knowing all the technology, that's probably what the Hopis had in mind. <laughs> we would call it a porous membrane. They called it the open circle. And the sphere with no sides. <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much, both of you, for such beautiful journeying. And I'm now going to welcome in Dr. Daniel Riders who his bio says that he is a cardiologist who happens to be a shaman, but I see Daniel as a shaman who happens to be a cardiologist uh, because uh, Daniel's been a part of the Peace Lab since its inception. And he always brings with us and to us a journeying of such qualitative experience that I am delighted that he's joining us here today. And so Daniel, if you can turn on your, there we are. Um, 
he heals all over the world and very much focused in Palo Alto or Silicon Valley. Um, lucky people that get to be with you directly, Daniel, is all I can say. Um, but what one of the things that we thought we wanted to, well, that we would like to do in the Peace Lab is that we've been journeying in the interaction of shape. And now if we can journey in to uncover the shape that lies within us. I'm going to turn it over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Leslie, and all you amazing, fantastic humans on stage and off stage. Um, I have designed a very ambitious guided meditation for today. And throughout this inception of this, of today, I keep coming up with the notion of slow down, slow down more. So believe it or not, in the shower this morning, so that I could smell good for all of you and releasing my fears of vulnerability and being bold and open, in a moment, in a flash came the knowledge, ritual and ceremony that we learn all of our lessons we may keep learning them, but at some point we find the gifts in them and then we don't have to learn those anymore. And we've had such richness today in this presentation. We are an emotional being with a belief system. I call it the emotional mind body. And it's the limbic brain. If you are a science person like me, um, I'm an electrophysiologist, so I dedicated uh, much of my life to the electromagnetics of the heart, which is so appropriate today. Um, but the limbic brain has developed over a hundred million years, and it's an ancient brain. And from all of these lessons that we've learned and all the gifts we've received today, for our limbic brains to move forward, for us to move forward, we need ritual, we need a ceremony. And so instead of moving quickly through all of what I want to do with great ambition, I'd like to slow it down and go into ceremony, into ritual. So I have a candle here. And I love to work with fire because we can activate things immediately with fire. Um, and so I'd like to activate peace in all of us personally and collectively today. So I'm gonna just go into ceremony with you all with your consent and put something on. So I feel like we're all in ceremony and think and feel peace in everything, everything in peace. I'm gonna close my eyes now and I invite everybody else to close their eyes. And I invite you to go into a meadow and feel and see your tree of life and walk up to it and put your hands on your tree of life and feel the life in it, the humming, the buzz of life and step into the tree and feel the minerals cursing up or coursing up, coming up from the ground the water and the minerals, the rivers through you and up to the branches. And notice that the branches form a canopy and they're all part of the collective. And then I like, then feel the streams of pure sunlight come down through the branches and leaves viewing your body, going through your body and going down into our mother. 
and notice how our roots talk to each other. We share minerals and other resources and information. Now, I'd like you to take a breath in through your nose and out through your mouth. In through your nose and out through your heart. In through your nose and out into the planets and galaxies. And keep drifting out. And then turn around and look at our universe, at the galaxies, the stars, the shapes, the patterns, the flows, and just take it all in in an instant. Then I'd like you, and take note, and then I'd like you to turn back out and keep drifting out, out past the stars. And I'd like you to feel perhaps a flame in your chest and notice its color and its size, and then let that grow into a sunburst and let it explode as sunbursts do out into the universe and out past the stars and just keep drifting. And then bring in curiosity and look around for other sunbursts around and take notice if you find one or many and just notice how they come into a coherence naturally. Pay attention to your doubts, your judgments, bring them all in and all of your emotions. You just pay attention and let them feel them, think them, know them, and then let them go with an oath to take care and pay attention to them at some point. Peace in everything, everything in peace. Now I invite you to come back into your tree of life and step out and open your eyes slowly as I will. And at some point today or tonight, I'd like you to do a ritual a ceremony. This seals the deal on all these teachings and gifts. So I'd like to use perhaps a toothpick. I'll put it in some fire and I'll just blow into it without putting the flame out. My shape and all of your shapes. And just let it burn to completion and activate your personal piece, shape or form and don't burn your fingers, but just lay it aside and let it do what it, fires do and move into peace in everything, everything with peace. And do this, this is a mandate for us to bring peace into the world, your personal peace today. Amen, a win, swaha. I'm, I'm finished. Welcome, Mo. Thank you so much, Daniel. You've offered us great depth with the universe yet. <laughs> Thank you. We get to dive into this, bringing it into form, so to speak, in our everyday life with peace, and everything, everything with peace. And this allows us to be able to shape our future consciously with the power of intention. 
for a peak experience in life. Peace in everything, everything with peace. This is a participatory opportunity. So we're gonna watch and listen and repeat, so to speak, the images that you see in here. Because the peacemaker meditation brings the body, the emotions, the mind, and the spirit into alignment and harmony. This harmony is radiated out as the circling Taurus that Lois mentioned and felt by others. Peace in everything, everything with peace. Scientific research has proven that when a small amount of people meditate in an area, violence, accidents, and suicides are dramatically reduced and health and performance are enhanced. So we get to meditate a new life into form like the imaginal cells did with the butterfly. The first element of peacemaker meditation may be done sitting, standing, lying down, or even exercising. So we get to do this now. Mentally or aloud, repeat with each in-breath, peace in everything. As you breathe out, everything with peace. Peace in everything, everything with peace peace in everything, everything with peace. Now you see me actually bringing my hands toward my heart with peace in everything. And everything with peace, I'm reaching out like as if my hand were reaching and giving a plate of love to people. Peace in everything, because everything inside gets peaceful. Everything with peace. Peace in everything, everything with peace at your own rate of breathing, we get to do this. The rocking forward and back allows us to bring that inside and share it outside, as Daniel said, in a ritual form. We rock back and forth like people in front of the wailing wall, but it actually works inside more too. And you can look up the physics of that if you'd like. Peace in everything, everything with peace. Peace in everything, everything with peace. We can do this in any language, everything with peace. Peace in everything, whatever language you speak at any time of day, if there's a little bit of an upset that happens, stop and touch your heart with peace in everything everything with peace. And you bring that consciousness, that intention alive, just by that, paying attention to what is happening inside ourselves with peace and everything with peace. Peace in everything, everything with peace. Peace in everything, everything with peace simple practice that will change the world because as below or as inside goes outside, that resonance, that harmony that is expressed and heart coherence, bringing that peace in the heart and sharing it, it radiates around the world. Look at the research in heart math and find lovers on one side of the planet meditating at the same time their hearts come into the same coherence and then long enough time meditating together like that they resonate with the planet's vibration imagine bringing peace in everything everything with peace we are so blessed to be together at this time in life, this time of transformation. And this is brought about by everybody's loving attention 
to that space of consciousness and love within. And I'd love to send you off with all my love, but it's not my love, it's our love. So we welcome you and send you off with great respect and love. And now I pass it on to Leslie. Well, I'm just rocking here and uh, <laughs> radiating the beauty of what you just shared. Thank you so much, Kurt. So I just want to bring Lois and Claudia back on and Jim um, in, in our gratitude for, and Daniel, of course, uh, in our gratitude for this circle of wisdom, experience, embodiment, imagination, all of me is and my, my image was, and I never thought it was going to come. My, my inner symbol was a five-pointed star, which I haven't thought about in decades. And that was what, Daniel, you brought to me. So my little five-pointed star is going to keep rocking out today. So Lois, thank you. Claudia, thank you. Nice Kurt, you. thank you. Daniel, thank you. You are all wonder. And I thank you so much. Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you. Yeah, I'm still rocking too, Kurt. Thank you so much. <laughs> it takes you back to the cradle, actually. <laughs> and uh, thank you all for this amazing uh, uh, session, uh, Lois, those architectural shapes. You know, I didn't know that most of the buildings that you showed even existed. I, I knew there was a couple of them out there, but uh, the, uh, the human imagination is, is uh, quite exquisite in the midst of all of our challenges and, and tumult. Um, and um, Claudia, the, your presentation uh, reminded me, you know, I had the great privilege of, of knowing and interacting with Edgar Mitchell for a number of years. And I, I was remembering something that uh, Jim Hickman and I, Jim Hickman's the chairman of our board here at Ubiquity University uh, and our chief financial officer since the beginning, actually, he and I have worked together for many, many years. And when we were at the Esalen Soviet American Exchange Program, uh, uh, Jim uh, had the idea with Rusty Schweikert and Edgar Mitchell uh, to bring the astronauts and the cosmonauts who'd flown in the US and Soviet space programs together. And when they started the process, it was illegal. It was considered a national security threat uh, for cosmonauts and astronauts to even speak together by law. And one thing led to another in the magic of uh, citizen diplomacy and the heartfulness of, of not only uh, Edgar Mitchell and Rusty, uh, but also cosmonauts uh, like Leonov, who was um, you know the first uh, Soviet to go extravehicular and and others, long story very short, in 1985, um, uh, 40 astronauts and cosmonauts met at Edgar Mitchell's estate at the time he was married to a voluptuous aristocratic French woman. And we all met in their chateau outside of Paris for a week and uh, created the Association of Space Explorers. And I can't tell you just as this little guy <laughs> uh, uh, hanging out with these astronauts and these cosmonauts for a week. And uh, one little story that, that brings this session into beautiful relief. There was one cosmonaut uh, there uh, who had set the world endurance record at that time for just going round and round and round. He was, he'd been, orbiting the earth. I think he was up for nine months or something like that. So I was sitting uh, with him at uh, lunch one day and asked him, what was it like? I mean, circumambulating the, the whole earth, the whole planet for nine months. And he said, well, you know, you go through this experience, first you're in awe, and then it becomes normalized. And then you start to really look for the detail and he said, we were receiving daily reports of the news. 
And here we were up experiencing infinity and the beauty of infinity, but all the reports coming in from the news every day were of horrendous situations. And he says, at that time, there was the Iraq, uh, Iranian war. Uh, if you remember uh, that in the early 80s and um, the Iranians were sending out children as mine detectors and thousands of Iranian kids were blown up in the deserts between Iran and Iraq. And he says, every time I would go around the world, every 90 minutes or so, I'd look at the Middle East and I would look at Iran and, and, uh, and I knew that kids were being blown up. And then he said something to me I've never forgotten. And he says, I realized in that experience that the world is, the earth is big enough for love and harmony, but too small for conflict and war. And so I just wanted to bring that story in just to thank all of you for this contemplation of the shape of peace. Uh, because I think it's, it's so uh, profound uh, in our inner being, tortured by our external environment. And yet, and this is the beauty of your meditation, Daniel, and what you brought in, Kurt, you know, no matter what we're experiencing, the body wants to pray. Yes. We want to love. We yearn for peace and harmony. So I just want to thank you for bringing that energy in. Uh, and um, uh, every month we try to make people aware of the uh, Global Coherence Pulse. I joined last month uh, that Claudia and Teresa Collins and, and Roland McCrady and various others uh, at HeartMath and IONS are convening every month to join with people all over the world who are just taking a moment to come into coherence with one another. I can't think of a more beautiful, healthy, and honorable and noble thing to do. So Claudia, I particularly wanted to thank you for uh, helping to birth the global coherence pulse because it's, it's one of the few things that human beings do on a regular basis that unites us all as one. And in the end, I think that's what peace is, is that, that disposition of being, of, of unity in thought and word uh, and deed. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you for that. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll uh, see you again tomorrow. One last uh, uh, offering as we close out, and that is Kate Rayworth's course on donut economics, um, which is peace in the image of a donut. <laughs> if you want to think peace in terms of economics, think about a shape of a donut. And uh, we uh, have been very vigorously promoting this course because it's launching our our new masters in regenerative action. And Leslie Southwick has been our team leader. And uh, we started from zero a couple months ago and we just passed 200 people from all over the world that are joining the course. Um, uh, and we would love to have a few more. So this is the last day before we start uh, at 10 o'clock a.m. Pacific time uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, uh, for the fundamentals of donut economics. So uh, that'll be tomorrow. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, we'll see you uh, same time, same station here on Humanity Rising. Bye for now. Thank you. Great session. Great session. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And come to the after chat. <laughs> Definitely. No doubt. Thank yeah, you all thanks. enormously for the opportunity to be with you so deeply. You were beautiful. You were so amazing. Each of you were, oh my gosh, my heart is 